death to life, bondage to freedom, incredible promises. But you and I both know that we live in a world with so many obstacles to that, so many things that wanna hold us back or push us down so that we never experience that. And I don't know about you, but I want to fully experience the promises of God, the freedom, right, the life. And I know that you do too. And, and, and my hope is that together we can experience those as we grow together in how we understand life and what God's truly about. And I can tell you this, in 1 John 4, 4, there's this promise that the followers of Jesus have been facing all kinds of obstacles. Then it says this in 1 John 4, 4, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, overcome the obstacles, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. I love that truth, and I want that for you. Now, beyond the obstacles we face externally, and there are many, there's even greater obstacles that we face internally. This idea of temptation, this idea of Satan coming along and saying, this is truly who you are. You're this mess. Just do this. It will feel good in this moment. I have a burden for us to overcome the temptations we face, the obstacles we face, and become all that God's created us to be. And so I wanna welcome you. It's a privilege for me to be speaking into your life uh, in this moment. I, I pray and trust the scripture will make an impact and a difference. But I want you to know we're launching a brand new series called Overcome. For the next four weeks, we're gonna talk about overcoming the temptation that's within us that holds us back from the promises of God. So as we work through this this morning, let's just start and identify with this. Where, where's a place that you're stuck? Where's a place that temptation has got you and you continue to practice, you're stuck in this mess. It's not life, it's not freedom, it's really, it's really um, uh, death and it's really this sense of bondage. Where is that? Where are you stuck? And I need you to know first and foremost that we can overcome this, but we need to look it in the eye. And so where are we stuck? Where are those temptations that we have been stuck in? All of us at some level or another face this. We're all in this. So let me just share some. Maybe it's a substance addiction, alcohol. I'm talking about needing to drink every night to unwind. I'm talking about this sense of having a dependency. The only way I can have some relaxation is, is through alcohol. Maybe you're smoking something that you shouldn't be smoking. Or maybe you're hooked on, uh, on prescription painkillers. Or maybe the temptation that you face that you're stuck in right now is you just lie a lot. You tell a whole lot of stories that just aren't quite true. Or you don't tell the facts. You're not even sure why. You continue not to share what's true. You just, it just comes out and there's lie after lie that needs to cover things up. Maybe the thing that you're facing, the temptation are these eating issues of, of overeating or unhealthy eating or a sugar addiction or caffeine. You've got to have that to get going in the morning. You've got to have that. It isn't just, I like a cup of coffee. Uh, it's more about the fact that you've got to have it. Maybe it's sexual addiction. You're looking uh, at things that just aren't good for you, something you shouldn't look at. Maybe you're acting out on things you shouldn't be acting out on. You're creating sexual fantasies, but there's a sexual addiction in your life or pornography. Or maybe it's gambling. You're, you're taking the very provision of God that he has given you and you're wasting it on something that, that has trapped you now into continuing to gamble it away. Or maybe it's about screens and social media. Maybe you can't sit down in the moment without getting out a screen and flicking through it and see what everybody else is doing. You can't even be present in a moment. Maybe that's your greatest temptation. Or maybe it's worry and fear about, about tomorrow. It overwhelms you. Maybe it's control, manipulation, and, and controlling people with anger. Those are just a few and you might be sitting there right now, listening right now, and you're like, I don't think you hit mine. Well, then just identify yours. You see, all these things are stealing from us, from you, from me. But God has victory for you. Satan is always wanting to tempt you away from God and steal from you, but God is providing a way for you to overcome. In fact, I can't help but go to the simple but profound truth that Jesus said. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. But the enemy is here to steal and kill and destroy. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. That's in John 10, 10. And so I want us to overcome. I want us to live in the midst of the victory of Jesus Christ in our lives. I want to talk about that. And the way I want to talk about this morning is to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 with me, uh, make sure you have, uh, if you've got your, uh, uh, the app, the Living Water app, you can go to the notes and download that right there and follow along with what, where I'm talking. It's good stuff. 
So the truth in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the apostle Paul is teaching the Corinthians, the town of Corinth, the city of Corinth, about what it means to follow Jesus. And let me tell you, Corinth, of any of the places that Paul went, struggles more with temptation and just what they're getting sucked into with their lives than anywhere else. And so he addresses these sin issues, but he comes to this place that really begins to teach them about how they can overcome. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13, here's what he says. So if you think you're standing firm, Be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And God is faithful. Man, God is faithful. In fact, right now in your chat, if you just type in God is faithful or say it out loud in the room that you're in, God is faithful. Look at at somebody across there and say, God is faithful. Tell your, your... your son or daughter, that God is faithful. Or just write it down if you're by yourself. But God is faithful. Put that in the chat because God is faithful to us. We face a lot of things, but he's faithful. There'll always be a way out. There'll always be a way to overcome, to throw that temptation to the side. So we're gonna talk about temptation for a little bit because I think that holds us back from this overcoming. In fact, as we go through this series, one week's gonna build on the next, so please stay with this. This week we're talking about temptation. Then we're, talking, we're gonna talk about a way to beat this on a regular basis, and then we're gonna talk about the spirit of God alive in in us, helping us to to overcome. But let's identify temptation right now. Temptation, here's a definition. definition. Temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. Anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. You're going to like this. It's gonna make you feel good. It's gonna make you think that life's more meaningful. It promises this satisfaction, but it's... The opposite of being obedient to God, it has a cost. And here's what happens. Counselors or scientists will tell you that when we give in to a temptation or something like that, it feels good in the moment. It actually releases a dopamine rush into our brain. And that is a a, a chemical, a brain chemical that makes us feel pleasure. So in that moment when we do that thing, when we make that purchase that we didn't really need to buy, or we make that second look, or we spend time looking at something we shouldn't look at, or or we speak our mind in anger out at somebody because they needed to hear it and it makes us feel good, there's a dopamine rush. We feel good for a moment but then as your brain rewards you for that moment then it begins to dwindle and after the sense of satisfaction there's this sense of oh I don't think I should have done that every single one of you who would consider yourself a follower of Jesus knows exactly what I'm talking about it felt good in the moment you're like oh I shouldn't have done that I feel bad about that I recognize I blew it again Temptation is this invitation to doing something that is, has a promise of making things better, but it never ends up doing that. So as I think about what God wants for us, I want us to look into the scripture that we just read and a few other scriptures to talk about temptation. Because if we can look it in the eye, if we can identify it, if we can see it for what it is, then we have a much stronger chance of overcoming it. But if we ignore it and just push it to the side and say, oh, it's just all something we deal with, we all struggle, then we will struggle. But let's look it in the eye, let's call it out today. So four things I wanna talk about what temptation is or isn't in what the scripture speaks to us. So here's the first one. Number one, temptation. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. Temptation itself, not a sin. It's actually part of our spiritual journey. We'll talk about that in just a moment, a little bit more about that. But let's look at the book of Hebrews to describe this. In fact, it's gonna talk about temptation and Jesus and give us an understanding. Hebrews 4.15, here's what it says. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Tempted in every way. Jesus, can you, that kind of blows my mind a little bit when I think about all the ways I'm tempted and we're tempted, that Jesus also faced that temptation. And it's interesting that it says a high priest or Jesus who is unable to empathize. So Jesus actually has a tremendous compassion for us and the things that we face because he knows the pain of it. He knows the, the allure of it. And he went through those things, yet he never sinned. Jesus was tempted. You see, there's a spiritual enemy that tempted Jesus. There's a spiritual enemy that we have that's tempting us. 
So it's not a sin to be tempted. In fact, let's think of it this way. Let's say that you have decided, you're convicted, not just a decision, but you're actually convicted by God that you need to eat healthier. You need to have the energy you can have so you can be everything he needs you to be each and every day. So you decide, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat clean, I'm gonna eat healthy. And you walk into the office and there's that, there's that clean white box, you know, from the good bakeries and there's donuts. You can smell the donuts and you walk by the donuts and you, you look at the donuts and you look at it and you're tempted to take one, but you go on by. It's not a sin. You were tempted. You recognized the desire, but you didn't. Now, maybe if you go back and you open the box and you sniff the donuts or you pick one up, you're probably crossing over. Or if you lick the donut and put it back, that's definitely a sin. You can't do that. In fact, you know, really, as I talk about this, there's not many boxes of donuts, but they will be back. Someday the boxes of donuts in your office area will be back. The big picture, though, is, is this, is that temptation is not sin. Temptation actually is an opportunity for spiritual growth. It's important for you to know that temptation is not sin because sometimes we feel that it is. Like I shouldn't even have looked. I shouldn't even been tempted by that. We beat ourselves up. There's like a false guilt that we'll um, fall into. And once we fall into a guilt or shame for being tempted in the first place, we're more likely than to fall into it because we're in this negative down pattern. You need to know that temptation itself is not sin. Here's the second thing that you need to recognize or know. You are not above temptation. You're not above temptation. In fact, the first uh, part of the scripture we read in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, it says, so if, uh, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. If you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Let me call out some self-awareness right now. If you're listening to this message and you're like, boy, I hope that so-and-so will hear this. Or maybe you're in the room with somebody right now and you're like, I hope my husband's listening. I hope my wife, I hope my teenage son is listening right now. If you're doing that, Let me bring some self-awareness. There may be an issue in your life right now where you think you're good and you don't need this, and that is a scary place to be. How is it the guy who is a great family man and everybody recognizes this is a family man, makes a mistake, makes, uh, falls into a temptation that ruins his family? How is it that the doctor can get hooked on prescription meds? Well, it's because people overestimate their strength or where they're at. And Paul says, be careful. He's talking to the Corinthians. I know you've made some good steps forward, but be careful because that temptation will come back and get you. In fact, in the book of 1 Peter, it says this, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. How's he doing that? He's looking for people in their pride, think they're strong because he loves to build up a false pride because that makes us fall. He's also looking in for weaknesses that we have. And you know what your weaknesses are. Any single uh, one of us is capable of falling into a sin that will hurt us or the people that we love very quickly. So guard against that self-confidence. You're not above temptation. So four things, right? So number one, it's not a sin to be tempted. Number two, you're not above temptation. Let me give you the third one. God will never tempt you. God will never tempt you. God will test you but he won't tempt you. And I think it's worthwhile to delineate the differences between those. So let's think for a moment, why are we tested in school? Right, you're an eighth grader, you get some tests to take at the end of the year, the finals. Why are you tested at the end of the year? Why? So you can be promoted into high school. So you can be promoted, step up to be that freshman. See, there are tests in our life from God because he wants to promote us. There are things that he's calling us out to to see if we'll be obedient to giving or to serving, to being the person he's called us to be. God will test us to push us forward, but Satan will tempt us to pull us back. God tempts us, or sorry, God tests us to take us forward or push us forward. Satan tempts us to pull us back in. James 1, 13 through 15 says this, when tempted... When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So as I look at this, what I see again and again is that God is the one who's building me up, but the enemy's the one who is tempting. And there's this, there's this progression that you read in the scripture and we don't have time to look at it all today but it's a great scripture to study because when we're tempted and we give into that temptation, we're dragged away, we're enticed by it. That sin leads to for a little while this sense of, of something that feels satisfaction or satisfying but it's that sin that gets us and when it's full grown, it leads to death. It's what takes us down. 
God will never tempt you. In fact, okay, I've been, I've been hinting at this, but let me, here's one of the most important things you can hear today. Temptation isn't just something that we have to throw out and say, this is awful. Actually, temptation is part of our spiritual journey, our overcoming. And while I don't want us to be tempted, it's something that we're gonna face. So let me say it this way. Martin Luther, who was the father of the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, he, he did some incredible things. He was an incredible thinker. And here's a quote from him that I saw that I wanna share with you. And it starts with this. It says, to, to be a theologian, you need three things. Well, it's in the 1500s, to be a theologian, to be somebody who thinks about God, who understands God, who acts on the things that God says. In order to know God, here's three things. He says, prayer, that's one. Two is meditation. So this is like prayer, meditation, okay, and the third one, temptation. There's three things that you need in order to truly know God. You need prayer, meditation, and temptation. Prayer, it's talking to God, right? Meditation is this idea of hearing from God, but listen to this one, what he said, the third one. Temptation, from temptation you learn to depend on God. Temptation is a tool of the enemy to destroy us, but the very thing that the enemy meant for bad, God means for good in our lives. He can turn it. And temptation is this opportunity for us to learn to depend on God. See, we are going to... um, Leverage temptation or temptation will leverage us. Every temptation then becomes an invitation to depend on Christ. I love this idea. Every temptation is now an invitation to depend on Jesus. When you recognize temptation, when you look it in the eye, when you see what it is and what it's about, and you choose to say, I'm not gonna go for the temporary pleasure, I'm gonna go for the obedience to God, it's something that allows us and helps us to overcome but every temptation is an invitation to depend on Jesus. I love that thought. All right, so three. I've given you three things. Here's the fourth one. The last one that I'm gonna share with you about temptation is this. It was in the scripture. It was really clear. There's always a way out. No matter what you're facing, no matter what destructive sin has you hostage, no matter what uh, small, annoying thing keeps coming back that everybody knows about, no matter what this temptation is, there's always a way out around it. And maybe you find yourself in a place right now, you might say like, man, I'm not just tempted by it, I'm living in it. There's always a way out, not just to the temptation, but also the brokenness and sin you've been engaging in. Next week, we're going to talk more about how to get out of that temptation or to run from it. But right now, if you're stuck in a sin, if you feel like you're just, you can't get away from it, it's not true. There's always a way out. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. It's just really clear. There's a way out for you. What's that look like? What's it look like if we're stuck right now in a brokenness? We've given into that temptation over and over again. Well, let me give you a couple of thoughts. God's gonna specifically give you the way out, but let me give you some big principles. Here's the first one. What's the way out look like? It looks like confession. Confession, to confess, to say it, to bring it out. In 1 John uh, chapter one, it says to confess your sin before God, and he's faithful and just, and he'll forgive your sin. So confess to God. In James chapter five, it says confess to one another so that they can pray for you and you can be healed, right? So there's this confession to God and to others. We need to confess in order to get out of where we're at today. We need to say that, we need to bring it into the light because secret sin always grows. Secrets that are bad always grow and become worse and worse. They, they become something that we can't control anymore, but the moment you bring it into the light, that light begins to, to melt it away, right? God in his light and infinite wisdom, once it's brought out, that's when it begins to be defeated. Satan loves to operate in secret. God loves, or the dark, and God loves to operate in the light. So how do you do that? Maybe you just need to go to somebody and say, not only am I confessing this to you, I just need you to know, I trust you, I need you to tell you where I'm struggling. Would you pray for me? That's bringing it into the light. Man, it works. What's the way out? Confession, prayer. Maybe there's therapy that you need. Maybe you need to find somebody who can help you. Maybe you're in a substance abuse situation. You just gotta get yourself into detox. And you say, well, what does that mean for my my life, my work, my family, all those things? It doesn't matter because it's gonna destroy all that if you don't get help. Maybe you need some counseling, somebody who can help you. Maybe it's professional counseling. Maybe it's a friend who can help counsel. 
Maybe there's accountability that's needed in your life. You need to get a couple people and just say, man, I'm struggling with this. Again, you're getting into the light. You're confessing it and saying, will you help me overcome it? Will you kick my butt when I need it? It's more of a man phrase, right? I don't see many women saying that. But will you help me move through this? And if I could just for a moment give you one specific tool. I had a friend come to me about 40 days ago now because the pro, it's, a, it's 40 days. And he said to me, I am struggling deeply with pornography. Can you help me? In the past, I've struggled to figure out how to help people. I've helped them a little here and there, but I found something I'm gonna share with you to use, to pass on to others, covenanteyes.com, an incredible tool if people are struggling with online pornography, purity, incredible insight, incredible understanding that come, covenanteyes.com. I just want you to know it's an it's incredible tool to use. It's one of the things God could use as a way out. Now, again, I, I, I don't know all the ways God might use, but there are, there, these are principles and things that God can do. As I wrap up, I want to share with you that there's hope. I want you to know that you can overcome and that you will overcome. I need you to know that you are not defined by the sin issue in your life. You are defined by the power of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus. That's how you're defined. I don't know how many believers I've talked to who've given their lives to Jesus and they know what it is and it's good, but there's a sin issue in their life. There's something they keep coming back to, this temptation they keep giving into. And what they start to do is define themselves by their failure and define themselves by their sin. And Jesus, his spirit is crying out and saying, no, you're my child. We can overcome this. Make sure you know you're defined by the power of Jesus, not the darkness of sin. In fact, that darkness of sin you're experiencing is just a a moment from your old life. Throw that down, push that aside, and claim the power in the name of Jesus. Whatever struggle you are in, whatever sin you identify, let that brokenness drive you toward Jesus. Don't hold it in. Don't think that he doesn't want to hear from you. Don't think that other believers would cast judgment upon you if they knew, when the reality is almost all believers, when they hear this, have compassion, say, I want to help you walk through it. But bring it to Jesus. You will succeed. Whatever you're facing right now, you will succeed. There might be moments of failure, but you will succeed in this if you never give up because the power of Jesus is there. Christ in you is much more powerful than the wrong desire, the temptation that you face. Let me go back to 1 John 4, 4. So clear. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who who is in the world. Now, this is just the beginning. You need to be with us the next couple of weeks as we talk about overcoming. Don't miss any of these. Catch them at a later time if you have to. But make sure you walk through this because I believe that God on the other side of this is gonna be setting you free. You're gonna be living life in a different way with a new understanding. Before we go this morning, before I finish though, let's pray. I wanna pray with you. Would you, would, you, would you sit up on the edge of your seat? Would you lean into this right now? Would you close your eyes with me just to help us focus? God, I am so grateful for your grace, your love. I'm grateful, God, that you have known, you have been tempted by all the things we've been tempted by. You know them, you empathize with us, you have compassion. So God, we come before you right now as broken people. And God, we admit to you the sin that we're keeping secret or that sin that we keep running back to. In fact, right now, would you identify the sin that you need to confess to Jesus? Would you just do that right now? Whatever it is, just confess it to him. Just give it to him right now. Yeah. Jesus, we confess these sins to you. And we ask Jesus that secrets would no longer be secret, that the brokenness will be brought into the light so we can find healing and wholeness and can overcome. Thanks, God, for forgiving us. Amen. So that's the start. That's the start. You might be listening right now and you might be saying, I don't know if I've ever really prayed to ask Jesus to lead my life, to confess to Jesus my sin for the first time and be his. And so right now, if that's you, if you're saying like, I, I need to know Jesus for the first time, would you, would you just let our hosts know there's a button you can click, you can say, that's me. But let them know you need to follow Jesus and they'll help lead you in a prayer to Jesus for the very first time so that you can begin to experience this new life. Because until you're a follower of Jesus,